We move now to the council time agenda. And I just remind everyone that this is October 12 at 9.58. We have uh, spent an hour in the work session on the capital improvement plan update with parks planning and development and the, the parks and lands division. Um, as we move into uh, public comment, I do have, uh, which is on the, uh, the agenda items, I do have one agenda item that has been requested for adding, and I'd like to go ahead and do that now so it's known by the public that that is added. And that is a work session request for uh, body and dash cam discussion. And don't know when that would be or, um, uh, um, you know, exactly uh, when it will be taken up but to get it on the uh, uh, work session request. The second thing there is I noticed there, we have a couple of different agendas that are posted in uh, the online version, the future of electrification in Clark County uh, was, was not mentioned as being a work session request, but in another agenda, it was my understanding and, and knowledge is that it has been requested, so that would be another uh, work session request that should be there on the agenda. Um, is there anything else in looking at the agenda before we move into public comment? Okay, so public comment at this time um, is on agenda items only. And by that, I mean only those items that deal with the council time agenda of today. So if you have uh, comments on other things that are coming up later on our calendar, this is not the time for that. Or if you wanted to comment about things of yesterday, it is not the time for that. It is only items on the agenda. So if you're in the hearing room, please let staff know your desire to speak or calling in star three or on your computer or tablet, the raised hand icon. Staff, do you see individuals who would like to give public comment? Um, Chair, I don't have any individuals in the hearing room and we do not have anyone online either. Thank you. Okay. So we move to old business and thank you uh, for that staff. Uh, minutes for October 5. Is there a motion for approval? Motion to approve, Madam Chair. Second. Moved and seconded. <clears throat> Any changes, suggestions, edits? Hearing none, they stand approved as drafted. The financial quarterly update. Kathleen Otto. I believe we have Mark Gasway, our finance director, on. Um, this, this was a, the request of council to have quarterly financial updates. So this will be the third quarter update that Mark will present this morning. Good morning, council. Uh, I, I, I wanted to show that we have the ability to respond quickly. We, uh, a few weeks ago, we had our annual report for 2021, which was 10 months after we closed the year. However, uh, Monday, we closed the quarter for the third quarter of 2022. So you're getting this fresh, hot off the press. Uh, this is a, uh, just a brief summary of the third quarter highlights. And I just want to walk you through those quickly. We uh, start out with highlighting the general fund, uh, where we're at year to date. You can see that our property tax is coming in uh, pretty, pretty close to what we have um, anticipated. And our uh, sales and use tax is also coming in strong. Our other revenue is down a little bit um, and that's made up of, of several hundred um, smaller revenues but you can see that uh, it, it is um, lagging just a little bit from the prior year. And I'll explain that down below just a little bit um, as we go to the third quarter, if you wanna scroll down a little bit. So this is the third quarter compared to the prior year. Um, one of the things I wanna point out that 
if you look at the sales and use tax for the third quarter, it only increased 6.4%, whereas year to date, we're at 8.4%. So that growth is starting to, to level out a little bit. If you were to look just at the month of October, it was 3.8% growth. So it's still growing, but it's slowing a little bit. I don't think we can anticipate the, the large, you know, 10 to 12% increases that we've experienced the last couple of years. Uh, on the other revenue side, and this is part of the explanation of why it's down. Last year, it, in this quarter, we received a large reimbursement from the Blake settlement. Uh, that did not happen this year. We haven't had as large of um, expenses or reimbursements into the general fund from the Blake settlement. So that's why that other revenue last year was so much larger than this year. Uh, there was the t uh, a timing of the receipt of our of our um, PUD privilege tax as well. Um, so I, I, looking at that, you can see the difference, but um, it's it's very explainable in what we received. So if we go down a little bit. The expense section for the general fund, we are um, on pace to spend uh, to underspend our budget this year. Uh, I, I I just want to point out for your reference the percentages to the right. Uh, we are about seventy five percent through the year, so you would anticipate seeing at least twenty five percent left in uh, available budget. However, we're looking right between you know, 30, maybe a little bit over 30% budget remaining, which means that we'll have some um, fairly significant savings uh, in our budget this year. And, and I think some of that has been communicated to you previously as well. Um, we anticipate seeing that and being able to roll that into our fund balance uh, and use as one-time expenses in the future. So. Uh, and, and feel free to stop at any point and ask questions on this. I, I'm going to go through this real quickly, but you're welcome to to jump in or we can wait till we get done um, either way. So. Actually, Mark, I do have a quick question on that um, salaries, on the savings. Is that mainly attributed to salary savings? Well, you can see up above the, the salary savings. We're at 29% uh, left in our budget. Uh, you would expect to see maybe around 25. So, yeah, so, yes, there is some in salary savings, but it's across the board. It's it's in the other areas as well. So, uh, salary savings is significant, though, because if you look at the dollars across the bottom, um, our budget in our general fund, 125 million uh, approximately in our uh, personnel services, our salaries and benefits, that's by far our largest budgeted area. So, okay. Uh, let's go down to the second page. So we have a couple of our other major funds listed. These are revenues collected uh, and and uh, first is the the road fund, 53% uh, revenue collected, which is um, probably typical for this time of year. We haven't included our October property taxes yet. And so um, that adds a significant amount of revenue to the road fund. On the other side is the expenses we've uh, were um, we've only spent 40% of our budget, which seems low. Uh, I would expect through September, through through our month closed, uh, we would have seen significant a significant portion of the capital expenditures. Although those do come in 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 October and November as well, so we're we're significantly underspending on the road fund expense side right now. Um, scrolling down to the community development, this is our building fund. I wanted to point out that. This is really four different areas. As you know, we have our building division, which uh, has a significant um, uh, fund balance. That fund balance is necessary to complete projects that are in process. You, as you know, we collect fees up front for these building projects, and sometimes it takes six to 12 months before those projects are actually completed, um, maybe even longer for, for some longer term commercial projects. So that fund balance, it, that's why we have that first darker blue bar. Over in the center, you'll see the uh, green bar. That is the development engine engineering portion. Again, those projects are long term, um, you know, usually six to 12 months or, or even longer. And so that's why you see that fund balance there. The two uh, other areas, the red bar and the yellow bar, those are our land use review and our wetlands and habitat review. Those are actually um, 
subsidized by the general fund. Those uh, two areas are uh, running, um, I, I guess, negative. We do collect revenues and we do have expenses. So we're incurring more expense than the revenues cover currently. Uh, the total of those two together we're anticipating will be about a million, close to a million one by the end of the year. So that would be a transfer that we would make from the general fund into this fund. As you know, building fees, um, engineering de development engineering fees cannot subsidize land use review or wetlands and habitat. Those have to be paid either through fees or through the general fund. Um, and then this is just a summary, uh, and you've seen this before in, in a little bit uh, different format, but this is just a summary of our uh, American Rescue Plan grant, uh, 94.8 million. And then these are the committed projects to date, about 65 million. So there's a, almost 30 million left that has not been committed. And then you can see the spending is starting to tick up. We're over 11 million now that has actually been spent on, on this project. And uh, I anticipate over the next quarter and into 2023 that this spending will, will um, pick up considerably as these programs are put into place. So this is what we've chosen so far to put in your quarterly update. We're happy to add information on any other area that you would like us to add. Um, again, we wanted to keep it brief, but we wanted to have uh, enough information so that you can um, make effective decisions. And particularly this uh, quarter leading into the budget discussion, uh, I know you want to have um, as much information as you can. So welcome to field any questions. Um, I know this was relatively uh, fast, but I'm, I'm hoping that it was beneficial. Madam Chair? I would, yes, go ahead, Councilor Rylander. So uh, this is just a clarity point for me, Mark. Um, are, are we are do we approach the the budget sort of a use it or lose it type of situation? Uh, it, it, I've dealt so much in my past career with the military, the government, where they had to if they didn't spend their money all out by the end of October, then they would not get it back for next year, and so that sometimes affected spending, which isn't always optically necessarily good yeah. so i i just wanted a sense of how that plays here yeah when we go into the budget and and you'll be getting you know updates uh, very soon we if if budget was approved in a prior year and it was not spent it has to be carried forward so in the budget packages that will be presented to you uh you will see carry forward items uh, they don't. They they are previously approved, or council has approved these, but they have to come back to you for um, expense capacity in the next year. So, to some extent, if you don't use it, you could lose it, but you can also ask for it to be reappropriated. And I think also. Um... It's not that we lose it per se. The department doesn't have the ability to spend it the next year, but if it's general right. fund, it will fall to our fund balance and general fund. And so the only one that we have to use or lose is the ARPA funding and that we have a few years because that will not carry forward beyond a certain date. Thank you. So, so, so the, you're right. The department would, have, would not have the ability to spend it without the approved expense capacity. Uh, Mark, from my perspective, for a quarterly update, this is perfect. Gives us a good idea of what's going on with some detail, but not an overwhelming amount of the, the, the most popular 900 pages of the budget report, if you know what I mean. Um, I have a question uh, on the sales uh, and use taxes. We know clearly that they cannot go up, up, up every year, 10%, more, another 10%, another 10%, and so on, because that is not possible um, given spending patterns or, or anything else. However, what I do wonder is, what does the 6.4% that we have this quarter um, mean in terms of raw, raw numbers coming in, raw dollars? Sure, let's go down, or if we go to the top of the first page again. 
Yeah, right there. So if you look at the bars, do you see the bars there? Yes. The quarter, we received just about $15 million in sales tax this year, this quarter. And then if you go to the bar on the year to date, we've received just about 42, $43 million. Okay. So, um, Historically, over 20 years, our growth in sales tax year over year is about four, maybe a little over 4%. And that includes going back 20 years. So that would include the, the um, you know, the great recession times when it actually declined. Usually we have smaller growth, but the last two, almost three years now, we've experienced extraordinary growth, which was unexpected due to the pandemic. Um, we don't anticipate that to go forward and we don't. I know that Emily and her budget assumptions, we don't use that. Um, we use the historical trend number going forward. So, and this, by the way, does not include clearly the new sales tax because that won't start until next year. Right. And would you pop down to the next chart too, where it says sales and use tax 6.4%. And uh, let's take a look at that and, and the, uh, the raw numbers that are involved for 6.4%, um, you know, versus what it had been and, and what's the, the effect of that going to be on the accounting in the long, longer term. Right. So that's about, it's about a million dollar increase for the quarter. So we were around 14 million last last year, third quarter, and this year, third quarter, we're about 15 million. So that kind of gives you a dollar amount of what that um, increase represents. It's it was about a million dollars for this quarter over last year, last quarter, this quarter, last quarter. So you're saying that the the raw dollar number has actually increased. Yes. Still. Oh yes. Yeah. Still. <laughs> and for the seeable future, probably will, based on retail patterns and and all that we're beginning to see again. Correct, but probably at a much smaller increase than we've seen the last two years. Not, again, increase is good. I'm not saying that increase is a bad thing. It'll just be slower. It won't be as, as quickly and or as, as much as we've seen the last two years. Other questions from council? Madam Chair. Yes, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I do want to focus on the American Rescue Plan grant slide. Yes. Yes. And hearkening back to the comment of uh, Councillor Rylander on my military days of being responsible for budgets, we used to have a glide slope, and, and you did have that earlier of whether you're on track spending uh, for that year's budget. Um, so this is a little bit different and we are spread out over a few years of, you know, there's a drop dead date as, as the manager just mentioned. Um, so my question goes to, you know, I, capacity, capacity to get this money spent and whether we're on track in each of these categories, you know, services to the unhoused, I was, we allocated more than 15 million. I know I can see we, we spent less than 2 million. And I know we have a couple more years, few more years to spend it. And I, and I also understand it's hard to find service providers. It's hard to find opportunities. We need to measure and admi administer uh, these, uh, these RFPs that go out. Um, but then there are others, North County EMS projects, you know, when's that going to be spent? I mean, that they sh I know they had kind of a slow start on getting their budget together and their resourcing. Uh, the community mm -hmm. grant program, I'm really concerned about. I think some of those individual uh, nonprofits were counting on this money. Um, yep. And, I, and, I, and, and let me speak to those. Spent. Yep. Let me speak to so, those. So uh, what is the challenge out there? Where, yeah. Is there something more we can do to make sure we're administering uh, the spending of this money in a pragmatic and timely way. Yeah, let me, let me speak to the grants. Um, primarily the time that it's taken us to get this money out is, is in the contract itself. 
we have to have a, a, a grant contract in place. Uh, we have sat down with uh, North Country and began uh, structuring the grant uh, contract so that we can get that money spent. Uh, that isn't anticipated to even go out the door until 2023, to be honest, that's part of the 2023 budget. Uh, with the community grants, we have reached out to all of the awardees and we have um, um, grant contracts. Um, we're almost finalized with those. Before, again, before a, a, a dollar can go out the door, we have to have the contract signed. A lot of the, um, Things that we're experiencing a lot of these organizations haven't had grants before or they're not they don't have grant personnel that that um you know specializes in this so the, the burden is really on us to make sure that all that gets put together uh we have to request certain information for example the the airway science that we were talking about yesterday that one um, we're looking to get their financial plan because we have to put that in the contract and so once we get all that put together the, the money will go out. Um, we had to determine exactly how these recipients were classified, whether they were, um, you know, awardees, as we talked about, or, you know, sub sub recipients. And, and we've sorted through all of that now. So uh, I still expect that this money is going to be all, uh, all of the community grant money should be out by the end of the year. So. Thank you. Other questions? Well, hearing none, I would just uh, say once again, Mark, thank you very, very much. And we look forward to this on a regular basis uh, every quarter. I think it will be uh, very helpful in continuing depth of understanding. Thank you for that. Yes. And, and Chair, in addition to uh, receiving the electronic copies, this will also be posted on our website on the financial report page. So anyone can refer to it there, uh, anyone that might be listening or you could refer um, um, citizens there as well. Uh, it will, we'll have it all published. It'll all be uh, out on the website. So. When it's on the website, what is this called? Just quarterly report? Yep, third, 2022 third quarter financial report. Great, thanks again. You bet, thank you. The Criminal Justice Training Center letter and resolution. This is probably a combination of Kathleen Otto and Councillor Medvidji. Let's start with Kathleen. Um, I know Councillor Medvidji and the council requested a letter and resolution to be drafted and Lindsay has gone ahead and drafted both of those so she can go over the terms in this and see if council wants to move forward with it. Good morning. So, um, what you have here is a letter that would go to Governor Inslee and also to Senator Lovick. Senator Lovick is the um, is likely to be the prime sponsor on the legislation. Um, and so the letter is just um, introducing the topic, saying that the county council recently adopted a resolution and giving the reasons why we're in support of the letter. Um, this is a very similar letter to the one that was prepared by the law enforcement council. Um, so you'll recognize some of the same, um, the same general themes within the letter. And if we can scroll down to the resolution. So the resolution here, again, this is very similar to what other jurisdictions have done. Um, it's Clark County specific, it's Clark County language. It's not um, a duplicate in any way, but again, the themes are similar um, regarding the county council's support for uh, expansion of the criminal justice training center beyond the, the primary state facility in Burien and the satellite facility, the small satellites facility that exists in Spokane, um, the plan to have a location somewhere in Southwest Washington, somewhere in Everett, up in Bellingham, and then another one in Eastern Washington, likely in the Tri-Cities area. So this is one that's specific to the expansion in Southwest Washington um, and talks about the challenges that our Sheriff's Office has had with regards to recruitment um, the benefits of having a, a regional facility in terms of being able to assist with those recruitment efforts um, and the, the difficulties that we have, you know, with recruitment and the, and the problems that that causes because we have those challenges with recruitment. So we can scroll down, um, can take a look at this. It's um, basically the 
the, the punchline, if you will, is that we're, we stand in full support. We're ready to work with our, our partners in law enforcement, our partners with the city and our legislative delegation um, and with the governor's office and Senator Lovick to, to push this through and um, be uh, assisting that process in any way we can. Councilor Medvici, was there anything you'd like to add? So I, I think this, thank you, Lindsay. I, I think the resolution and the letter captures all the salient uh, reasons why we should support this and speak up as quickly as possible. Our cities already have. Uh, we need to reinvest in law enforcement. And this is a statewide issue. You know, whether you're a lateral from coming out of state or someone new, uh, looking at a law enforcement career, whether corrections or patrol, you need to be post certified. And it is extremely challenging for our chiefs and, and sheriff uh, to say to a new recruit, we're going to offer you a position, but we don't know when you're ever going to be able to go to the academy. And that's pretty much the situation. It could be months, it could be a year. Um, they get allocated spots. And to, so to tell a recruit that, well, we don't know what, what your training pipeline will be when you'll be a, a full-fledged deputy or corrections uh, or police officer, um, you know, they look for somewhere else to go. Uh, so this is a huge recruiting tool and, and, and certainly having it in our next door or in our neighborhood, whether it's in Clark County or somewhere else in Southwest Washington, it's going to be a lot, a lot more attractive for fathers and, and mothers to have their child uh, go to an academy nearby. Um, and, and all the things in life that go along with just having to move away to get trained for a, for a period of months. Uh, this will be a huge uh, plus to our recruitment ability and a huge plus to fill all these vacancies we are experiencing. So I, I'm hoping we can uh, move this forward. I have no corrections that I'd like to make. I, I think it's ready to be approved by us and, and the letter to get our signatures. I think this is a great initiative uh, by the governor. I'm hoping the legislature jumps on board. I'm certainly already starting to see uh, quite a bit of support on uh, the Association of Counties. Um, pretty much everyone is in favor of this uh, to get regional uh, training academies. The last thing that I would add, um, I do know that Senator Cleveland and Representative Stonier did attend a tour of the Washington County, Oregon regional training facility that they have over there. Um, that uh, the city of Vancouver police chief uh, Maury was uh, in charge of in his former position. And so they went over and they toured that facility to get an idea of what a regional law enforcement training facility looked like. And it's my understanding that both Senator Cleveland and Representative Stonier were, were very supportive of the idea um, and wanted to make sure that they, they personally would be part of championing uh, bringing such a facility to Southwest Washington. So uh, we definitely have some support within our legislative delegation so far. A compliment. I noticed that despite our discussions in the past on where this might be located, and there was discussion about the possibility of uh, uh, Bonneville, um, that is not in the resolution or the letter. And I think that is a, a very uh, good move to uh, leave that out because after all, there is flexibility on that. And the, the point is to have the facility here, not just where it would be. Um, I think we should have a motion on the resolution first because the letter references the resolution. Is there a motion for approval? Chair Bowerman, I would recommend that we put this on Tuesday's agenda for council's consideration and approval. That's right. This is council time. <laughs> I'm just so ready to get stuff done. Um, okay, Tuesday it is. And uh, what will that, do we know what that resolution number will be? We don't right now, but we'll make sure you know before Tuesday. Great. And um, we'll put it on the Tuesday agenda, resolution first, and then the letter. Okay, next is jail update. Kathleen. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, so just a quick update this morning. Uh, questions and answers are now listed on, on the internet. Uh, so anybody in the public who would like to see any of the questions and answers, if you go on to the main page and click on jail management transition. Again, the email also, if you have questions or feedback is ccjail, as in Clark County Jail, at clark.wa.gov. The internet site we anticipate will be up this week or within the next week and a half. Um, this will share information specific to employees. Uh, Will and Amber did participate in listening sessions with the Support Guild last week. Uh, listening sessions are um, scheduled for tomorrow with the commanders, and it is anticipated that these will continue with all the affected employees weekly moving forward. Um, Amber has reached out to all the local police chiefs as well to start regular ongoing discussions with them to answer questions and participate in any part of this process. And I anticipate those will actually continue after the transition is done. Um, and I think I mentioned before, the budget allocated to the jail, including corrections deputies, is pretty straightforward. Um, we're anticipating to transition this within the 2023 annual budget. We do understand that the support guild is a little bit more tricky and complex as they support all the branches in the sheriff's office. And we anticipated that these discussions would continue into next year. But with that said, we did meet with the sheriff's office leadership team last week. And the sheriff's office leadership, which did include the sheriff and under sheriff and their chiefs, asked us, the county, if we have the ability to dedicate resources to finish the transition in its entirety by January 1. Um, we did share our commitment to do what we can to support their request. Um, and just so you know, I did let the sheriff know that I would be sharing this information with the council and the public during today's meeting. So he is aware that I was gonna be sharing this. Um, they are pulling together initial data to share with our um, staff by the end of this week. And I believe meetings are scheduled by the first of next week when our leadership team is actually on board and we will hit the ground running and, and dedicate the time necessary to meet um, the sheriff's request and trying to get this done by January 1. That's all the update unless, Amber, if I've missed anything that you wanted to add. Nope, you hit every other topic that I had on my list. Thank you. Questions from council? Yep. Madam Chair. I heard. Um, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Councillor Olson. I was going to mention her CVTV appearance okay. today, but maybe she'll go into that first. Oh, <laughs> did you watch that? <laughs> um, the only the only thing, Kathleen, I, you know, I understand the this desire by the sheriff to try to get this completed by the first of the year. Um, it sort of is in conflict and contrast to our message when we first made this decision that this was going to be a longer term transition, that this was going to be, you know, judicious and careful and thoughtful. And I know we're going to do all of that. So I guess, um, you know, we're kind of stuck here with the anticipation or the, the communication to the public that this was going to be a particular type of process. And now it looks like it's going to be even more truncated and appear to be more rushed. And I just wanna make sure that we are really, really clear and careful about how we communicate what we're doing to the public. And that, um, I know you said you're gonna do your best, but if we can't do it and it can't be done appropriately, it can't be done well, I, my thought would be we we do what's best to manage this transition. So just, I'd like your thoughts on that if you don't mind. Yes, um, I, I do have concerns with meeting uh, the request of January 1, but we will do our best. So we'll do it at a minimum weekly updates. We can update online as well. I mean, they're gonna be in the weeds of FTE, budget allocation, services, contracts, um, different impacts with different departments like fleet. So there, there are a lot of very specific things. I do wanna note, I don't think um, we're going to meet um, any deadline to amend the budget to have the final budget to transfer of the support guild and FTE uh, by January 1. We could, and if we do, then I will bring that forward during a bu our budget process for 2023, but that is really ambitious. And I know just getting that proposed amendment for the, clear, the cleaner 
piece, which is the, the budget that's for the jail and the corrections deputies, I mean, that's taking some time, um, to, you know, while it's clean, there's still a lot of reports that have to be run and validated. Uh, so I do have a concern, but, um, and I agree with you, you know, our anticipation was, you know, learning from the other organizations who have done this and done it successfully, it took six to eight months. Um, I do know we're going to have, you know, transition in some of the leadership in January with the new sheriff, and I know that's probably part of why they're asking for this, um, but we will do our best. Um, it's going, I mean, we have three new leadership team members that will be joining on Monday, and Amber will be spending a significant amount of her time to engage in this process and do what we can, but, you know, we're not going to jeopardize the transition by rushing it. If If we can't do it, we're not going to do it just to to make that break. We have to do it and make sure that it's gonna be successful and that we haven't missed anything. One other thing I'd like to add, Councillor Olson, is our commitment, as we said, is to the staff. And by rushing this, this is not helpful to the staff. So we will do our best, as Kathleen said, but it is, will be done with the best intentions and as judicious as possible to make sure that this transition is and will be successful for our employees and the inmates that are in the facility. Thank you. And I'll just, um, you know, reiterate your words from yesterday. You know, we don't have any options. We have to get this right, or from Monday, we have to get this right uh, for our employees and for those who are incarcerated. And um, you know, so, you know, I, I would, yeah, you, it sounds like you have it. We're not going to be pressured into making decisions that aren't in the best interest of the transition and those who are going to be impacted by it. So. So I actually wasn't going to comment on what was just talked about, but now I feel like I must. So I, I want to comment on that first and then make a request of the, of the manager. So I don't want this to sound like we're now pushing back on the sheriff trying to move forward. <laughs> we're not. Uh, what this is about is very deliberate, very pragmatic steps that will be taken in order with collaboration with all of the stakeholders. If it happens quickly, which we're on a good course to make it done pragmatically and do, in a determined way so it gets done in a reasonable amount of time. We're not gonna rush it, but we're not gonna slow it down. Uh, everyone is engaged and we've had good outreach from uh, open houses to the employees, open forums uh, with the sheriff. Uh, different leadership, you know, we're going to engage very quickly and on the mental health side with our stakeholders for the mental health sales tax uh, initiative that's kind of got part and parcel to some of these jail services transfer. Anyway, it's going to be deliberate and pragmatic. We're not pushing back on the sheriff now wanting to move forward very quickly by January. That's an arbitrary date. Um, so I think I just kind of summarize I, what everyone was just saying, but I wanted to make sure the public doesn't think, oh, now they're switching courses, now they want to slow down. Uh, that's not the issue at all. What I was going to say is, you know, this is a good update, and I, and I appreciate that you put um, the web page, question and answers, so that, you know, when I get a constituent that says, what's going on, I don't know anything, I can forward them uh, to that web page and say, here's a lot of information. And I did that with the press as well when you first uh, made it uh, the link active. So an update like today, I would think you could put it on there. I know the uh, county uh, manager, uh, the chair has been doing updates uh, on her own. And, and I mentioned uh, the CVTV appearance by uh, Councillor O. Olson. And I think it's primarily on, on jail services. What I would ask is that your updates, even if it's just a paragraph or a few sentences, go on that same web page so we have we can forward any issues. The press can go and look and say, well, what's new this week? What have they what have they accomplished? What are they looking at? I think um, just a quick link to an update would be uh, on that same page would be a great thing to do. Thank you for that feedback. I can certainly uh, write a summary and also put a link to this conversation with the time that it started. So if anybody in the public wants to actually hear the verbal update, it'll be available. I do have a question for the county manager. Um, Go ahead. I'm, Go ahead. Cur I'm curious as to have you had any email responses to the 
that you got up so far. I would just sort of on an ongoing basis be generally curious as, you know, we got we got zero, we got one, we got 20,000, you know, whatever. I'd just be sort of curious as to what the engagement is or is not. Um, I'll, I haven't, I've heard we've had three. I will talk about the first two. I have not read the third one. The first two were, hey, just so you know, we still have, we have a service, um, you know, that is provided and will the service continue? And then the second one was actually, um, just as a heads up, there's a new law change that's coming to effect. Um, I don't remember the effective date on that, if it was the first of the year. Correct, and it was on inmate um, being able to have uh, free conversations with family members, and I think you'd mentioned that in a prior conversation, Councilor Medvigy, how important that is. So we received that from a constituent, just heads up of um, a change in the federal law of what that, what that looks like. So uh, we will add that to the transition plan as we are um, receiving these comments from the public. Are there additional questions? Uh, counselors, I'm curious if you are yet using the um, update page or the FAQs in your responses to constituents. I, I know that I am and I find it frankly very helpful in getting depth into the responses to constituents when otherwise some of the uh, duplicity of questions and the number of letters to respond to um, leads to a too much uh, uh, short information and not the depth that I would like otherwise. So anyway, to make a long story short, the FAQs for me have been important in providing that depth. Uh, so I, I personally have, have used them and, and find them very helpful. Have any of the rest of you done that already and found it helpful as well? Well, I think, um, you know, when you get a, one of these emails the next time, probably today, that is long with a whole lot of questions about the, the jail and the decisions, um, don't forget that FAQ page because I, I think it will be uh, super as a reference for you. Anything else from the council? Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Blake cases. So good morning again. The question here before the, the council, and this is really a, a topic for the county manager, but she and I wanted to get your feedback and input on this. Um, you'll recall that the, the Blake decision from the state Supreme Court um, has an impact, of course, on individuals who have had a conviction for possession of certain controlled substances. Um, and that they're, in many cases, entitled to vacate those convictions. So our attorneys have been going through diligently and um, assisting people with those cases. They have been um, doing resentencing on the cases that uh, individuals who've been incarcerated, um, and they're working through the, the vacating of the cases. So we have been handling those cases uh, um, within the county, uh, like most counties in the state have been doing. The Office of Public Defense, or OPD, has given counties the option for 2023 uh, to contract with, well, not contract, but to delegate OPD to handle the cases on behalf of the county. So then OPD would contract with attorneys in our area um, to handle the Blake cases for residents in Clark County who need assistance with their, their Blake case. So we have two potential paths forward. One. We can um, request and apply for grant funding as we've done in the past um, to assist with the expenses of doing the Blake cases internally. Uh, we would then continue to manage all of the, the Blake cases, all of the contracts associated with that, all of the payments associated with that, and would utilize the grant funds to um, pay for those expenses. Alternatively, we can designate OPD to handle these Blake cases for us. Um, given the, the staffing issues and the, the potential for changes within the Injured Defense Office, it's my recommendation that we um, have OPD handle these cases. Like I said, the, the 
the vast majority, if not all of the cases we're aware of at this point that require resentencing have been handled. So we're, we're really talking about the vacating of convictions at this point. Um, and I think that OPD has done a fabulous job in other counties to, to handle this. I have no concerns about their ability to handle this for Clark County residents. Um, and I think that that's the, the best path forward for us at this time. So just wanted to get a chance to get counsel's feedback on that, any input that you may have, and then uh, talk about our next steps. Council? Madam Chair. Let me, let me just begin by giving an open ended uh, comment slash question and, and others can react to it. Something that the public is, is very concerned about and is reading quite a bit about in the paper deals with um, the uh, release of people who were in jail on some kind of a charge, could be misdemeanors or uh, whatever. They're uh, let out of jail and then commit further crimes. What would be the um, the situation with OPD um, making decisions that would affect Clark County negatively in a, a manner that would be uh, releasing people that maybe Clark County uh, people would not be releasing? And that, you know, there's a, there can be a difference in philosophy and approach, and and uh, what is it? I mean, what what? How do they approach case decisions on Blake or or um, drug charges? I guess in general uh, that that include Blake, um, maybe differently than we do in Clark County. What what thoughts are there on that? Sure, and that's a good question. Um, and I think this is a, definitely a situation where this is more of a technical issue, um, but the public certainly may take that and say, oh, you know, individuals are, are getting released on drug charges and they're committing other crimes. Um, so this is technically separate and apart from that. But to answer the question, so the, the state Supreme Court invalidated and found unconstitutional people who had convictions for certain possession of drug crimes because there wasn't an intent element that was proved within the crime. Um, and so the state Supreme Court has made the determination that individuals, certain individuals that meet certain criteria, their convictions are not constitutional. And so it's not a question of Clark County making a certain interpretation or anybody else making an interpretation. This is the state Supreme Court's interpretation as to the constitutionality of their convictions. So when it came to resentencing cases, those are for individuals that are currently incarcerated, either on this charge related to the Blake case, or oftentimes um, they're, you know, with a resentencing, they have multiple convictions. And so then the court has to look at it and say, okay, they were charged with three crimes, including this, this Blake related case. We're going to take off the Blake case. Now we need to determine what their sentence should be based upon the remaining two, just for an example. Um, and so it's, it's not a determination of what whether or not somebody should should be released or shouldn't be released, it's addressing the con the constitutionality of the fact that they cannot be held, they cannot be sentenced, um, and serve time for a for a crime that has been determined by the state supreme court to be unconstitutional. And so um, that's where OPD won't be making a distinction compared to Clark County. Um, OPD would contract with probably the same local attorneys that we're currently contracting with, um, that the county currently has those, those contracts with. So it would be the same attorneys. They're going to be making the same kinds of arguments. Um, and I will say that, you know, our prosecutor's office for any of the resentencing is involved in that process and they're making, um, you know, their recommendation as far as what's appropriate and the defense counsel is making their recommendation and, and making their arguments, um, you know, based upon the facts and the legal standards involved in the particular case. So there's nothing as far as changing from the county structure to OPD that would change that in any sort of way um, because it's still left to the discretion of the individual attorneys as to what arguments to be made and it would likely be the same attorneys involved. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to go even a little bit further from the explanation that was just given. Um, this was very troubling and it's not the first time we've seen something like this. 
Uh, this county and every other county was handed this decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, other courts across the country have dealt with similar issues, missing elements of the offense within a statute, and simply read them in, implied them. Of course, you have to have knowing possession of a controlled substance for it to be illegal. And then you would instruct the jury. Problem solved. What, that didn't happen here. Uh, what we have essentially received in every county is subject to this is an unfunded mandate from the Supreme Court. And it didn't apply just to uh, the, the Blake case. They made it retroactive. They made it apply to every single defendant known to the, to the state. And then uh, dictated what the remedy should be. This wasn't a civil case with a certified class uh, action, you know, with individuals and the named class. Uh, this was very different. Uh, it really does, um, it is very troubling uh, that it really was a super legislative act by the Supreme Court that now the Attorney General and, and the legislature is trying to deal with. And I, I think they're doing it as best they can by now funding that unfunded mandate to each of the counties. Uh, what, um, what our defense bar and what our prosecutors are doing, what our courts are doing is the best they can in, in reaction to that court case. So uh, this isn't something we can change uh, locally uh, or react in a different way. And as, as uh, I almost said, Counselor, uh, you are the, I know she has great legal training too. She was absolutely right. I mean, this, it was found unconstitutional and it applies to everyone and it applies retroactively. Uh, we had no say in the matter. Madam Chair. Yes, Counselor. My, my perception is that the PA's office has a, a lot of burdens and balls to carry at this particular point and that offloading this to uh, OPD uh, would actually simplify and perhaps even expedite uh, things. So uh, my perception, tell me if I'm wrong, is that we can offload this to them. We won't have to handle the budget and the handling the money and all the negotiations and discussions. We can, we can let them take care of it. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That's accurate. Yeah, it, like I said, it would it would continue to be likely the same defense attorneys that OPD would be contracting with that the county is currently contracting with. It would just no longer be the county's responsibility to handle that administrative piece. Councilor Rylander, it also would be <clears throat> essentially they would be the coordinator that we have that does for engine defense. They would be coordinating this service for our county. That's probably in the most simplistic terms for what they would be offering us for this service. So it simplifies it in, in the end, boil it all this till down, it simplifies it at least from our end of things. Make Which, it yes, and I think that as Lindsay stated, you know, most of the resentencies are done, these are looking at big cases, and um, that's why I think the OPD gave that option for this year for counties to be able to utilize them to do this service instead of sending the money locally to where we would need to coordinate those services. And unless there's some downside to doing this, I would think it would be make sense. I, I do have one or two quick questions, Lindsay. Um, one is, will this, because they will be using some of the attorneys that we have a current contract with, does this have any conflict or impact on their current contract provisions with like how much, how many points they have, how much they're getting paid, or is it completely separate? It's completely separate and that's actually a good question. It's actually beneficial for us um, where we have a resentencing case, the current contracts allow for that to be considered a half a point. Um, and so that goes towards their overall contract total. And so um, many of our attorneys who handle the Blake cases are some of our most senior attorneys. Um, and we need to make sure that they continue to have the capacity to, to handle our Clark County cases. So it actually ensures that we have sufficient contract capacity within our existing cases. Obviously they have to stay within the state caseload standards um, and that's set 
by the the state bar and that's not, that's something that we ensure that they meet the standards but it's responsible for them to adhere to those standards so um, no it doesn't have an impact um, other than actually okay. potentially freeing them up okay thank you and then the second question and and first tell me if this is correct it's my understanding though if a judge even with the con or i, I why this is on the agenda today is I was under the impression that the county, the council would have to sign a contract with OPB because they're a state agency, but apparently there's not a contract. It's just a, a form that's being filled out. Um, but it's my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, that if a judge still assigns a case to one of our attorneys, the county is still responsible for paying for it. Um, so that that is a risk, and if that is true, have we talked to the judges? Because what we don't want to do is let OPB manage this administrative process of assigning those cases, those cases, and then have judges assign and then we're paying for it, and we don't have the grant funding to pay for it. Correct. So it's something that I would, um, depending upon the results of today's conversation, that I would talk to the bench about and make sure that they um, adhere to the current standard. So currently, the um, Indigent Defense Office assigns all of the Blake attorneys. The court doesn't assign any of those. Um, and so that would be something where we would continue to have that communication with the bench to say, continue do what you're doing. Do not assign cases. Instead of having Indigent Defense Office do it, you're going to have OPD Office do it. So it's just a different referral source for them. Um, to do it, but they currently are not assigning attorneys, but you're correct that in the event that a judge were to do that, and of course, they're an independent elect, um, then the county would, we would have to pay for it. So, but the, the standard is $90 an hour. Um, and so it's something where we would need to communicate with the bench, make sure that they're comfortable with that. They've been doing that so far. I don't anticipate any issues. So I guess with that, my, my question to the, the council is, that, is there any other concerns or any reason that we wouldn't have OPD handle this or otherwise I will plan on moving forward to have OPD handle these? Madam Chair. Yes, Councilor Olson. Yeah, I would uh, support uh, having OPD handle these cases. Do we need a motion or? No, we just need agreement. Um, no, I think just your feedback is sufficient for today since you, um, this is not under council's purview since there's no contract. I'm going to couch this as another question to, to Lindsay. With this process, is there is there more of an opportunity for the county uh, to seek funding from the state legislature? I mean, it, that's been the problem for the last couple since the Blake decision came out is, you know, all the counties trying to get together and figure out, well, how much is this going to cost us? And how is the state going to pay for it? Um, is this a better, more organized approach in your, in your um, thought process that we will get that funding that we'll need because of this decision? I think that the more centralization that happens with OPD, there's a certainly a legislative benefit because OPD is the one that is going to be making the funding request as they have in the past. Um, they have a legislative request for the subsequent biennium um, that they're going to be making. And so that covers not just the defense attorney costs, but also the refunds of the legal financial obligations, the LFOs. And if there's one centralized place that is making that request, as opposed to coming from a variety of different counties all at different rates trying to figure out how much this is we don't really know and so where there's uncertainty it's less likely to move forward so I, I don't think that this is um, going to be the one factor that will sway the legislature one way or the other but I do think it helps okay and so in that vein I, I do tepidly support uh, moving forward and hopefully this all works out in the long run I would uh, be delighted to give my support. It's presented as if it's almost a mindless decision that whether um, the cases are handled <laughs> by the attorneys or by OPD, it all comes out the same because there's really nothing to think about because the, the Supreme Court has already said what it's going to be. I'm not so sure that that actually is the case when a, a person coming before them has multiple charges, but at any rate, I would like to answer the question, but I don't know enough about OPD to 
uh, be able to have an opinion one way or the other. So I'm a neutral on this at this point. Don't know anything about them. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, we have two, I think. Um, Councillor Medvedji, are you you're supportive, correct? Yes, I I think Councillor Lance is not on, and I'm not sure I heard from Councillor Ryland. I support. That's who I was going to ask next. <laughs> Councillor Rylander, are you supportive? I was just trying to see if we had three. Uh, uh, yes, I actually, I said I, I support. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I uh, didn't count that. So, uh, we do, you do have uh, three. So, that's your answer. Great. Thank you. Um, New business, Senate Bill 4295. And uh, Mark Gasway, you've done some great work on bringing forward the details of this uh, Senate bill. Would you like to introduce it and propose a letter perhaps that we send? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, this um, slide that that they have up in front of you. It outlines um, briefly what the letter would uh, contain. Uh, I also have a draft letter prepared that um, I would request that could be sent on behalf of the county uh, through the county council. Um, the auditor's office, myself, would also be willing to co-author and sign this um, with you as well. Uh, it, it explains that Senate Bill 4295, which is currently in Congress and could possibly be attached to a much larger bill for our um, defense spending, uh, what it would do to the, um, the uh, government reporting requirements. And it would uh, significantly change what we're doing now. Uh, as you're aware, we have uh, a significant amount of reporting that we do. Uh, it is all done through um, what we call our governmental accounting standard board. And we prepare uh, significant reports each year, including our annual financial report, our uh, quarterly reports as you received today, our trends reports. Uh, this would change all of that. Uh, it would put the reporting requirements under uh, federal uh, rules and would require significant changes to what our state has already done to ensure transparency. So there's uh, a, a cost that would be involved to the county that we would have to bear to make those changes. It would take significant amount of resources and effort as well as, as dollars to get this done, uh, which would be uh, not funded by federal government, we would take, we would, we would bear the burden of, of doing that. Uh, there's a couple of other issues that I've outlined in the letter. Uh, the question of whether the responsibility of this lies with the federal government. There has already been um, questions raised that this is kind of uh, a overreach of what has been done in the past. And the time frame involved, the requirements right now would uh, would have us make these changes within a two-year time period. And as we've experienced in our recent uh, software implementation, these changes just can't be done overnight. It, a two-year time period would be very a very short time period to uh, make those changes. So that's all outlined in the letter. Uh, this is a draft at this point. Um, we could certainly um, amend it or um, edit it, uh, and then um, if the council is in agreement, then uh, how we would like to have it signed would be the, the final question. So, Chair, I, I'll turn it back to you if you have any questions. You know, um, just a comment, Mark, one of the things that I appreciate particularly about the letter is that it does mention the unfunded mandate and the effects financially but it doesn't stop there. And I, I see the implications to you on 
rediscovering so many so much in terms of ways to report things and all as a real intrusion into your the, the way you do business and uh, you highlight that here and I, I think that's great um, other comments from council madam chair yes councilor rylander I appreciate the uh, the intent of the federal government to try to sort of standardize, make things uniform across various bodies, but I do personally believe it's a federal intrusion into local choice. Each of the entities are unique and different. They have some history, the preferences and how they gather, organize, and share information, et cetera, and to try to turn this into sort of one giant uh, look at everybody everywhere is absolutely the same is is uh, doesn't make business sense to me at all as it's pointed out and I actually believe it's a significant intrusion into allowing us to do things the way we need to do them based on our local needs and community other comments Well, uh, would council feel um, it would be appropriate uh, to uh, send a letter that is comparable to the one before you now? Uh, virtual. Funds, that letter, I believe, goes to Patty Murray, right? It would go to both senators. This is just a draft that we would send one to each of our senators. Chair, I would support sending a letter in either this form or any minor tweaks that make sense. And, and I thank Mark for the detail and all the substance in the in the letter. I support it as well. As do I. So as do I. Three. Yeah, as do I. Also, want to say thank you, Mark, to, to for taking the time and including the detail that you did. It's um, it's more powerful when you have the data and the detail that you have. So thanks for doing that. So, so, uh, chair would, uh, if maybe we could answer answer the last question, should I address this then, uh, with your signature on behalf of the. Of the board, or would all the counselors like to sign this? I'm not quite sure what the protocol yeah, is. If, if uh, it sounds to me like the other counselors are, are, are willing, we don't know about counselor Lentz, but uh, presuming that she is as well. Um, I uh, always feel that when counsel. Uh, unanimously support something like this, it has more power than when it comes just from the chair. So that, that would be my uh, desire that it come from all. And um, I, I hope that you'll be writing a comparable letter. And, you know, we talked about the possibility of you co-signing. I, I don't know. I think maybe your own letter separately would be good. And power in numbers, you know. <laughs> sure. That's that my be... thought. Does council agree with that? I, I agree with it, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, make sure that Councillor Lentz has the availability of getting her name on it too. So thank you for this, and um, I think we have our our answer. We have uh, we share the concern on Senate Bill forty two ninety five, and frankly, that was not in my. Uh, horizon of, of of looking at the uh, bills before us until you brought this to our attention. I don't know about the others, but thank you for doing that. And, and I will work with um, the county manager staff on getting the the um, signature line correct and, right. you know, county letterhead and the whole work. I'll, I'll try and get that um, to you tomorrow. So. They're pros. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, uh, the next uh, new bit of new business, 3.2, is the tolling resolution and white paper. Um, this is a combined effort uh, stemming from Dick Rylander's um, involvement with a committee that we assigned him uh, to attend and uh, working uh, with others, but especially Lindsay. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dick, would you like to begin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so before you today is a uh, uh, hopefully a relatively short, but 
sufficiently referenced in detail the review of tolling and mobility pricing as proposed by the state of Oregon that covers not just the I-5 bridge, but the I-5 corridor, I-205, and mobility pricing on top of those tolls uh, as projected. So the concern that, uh, from constituents in Southwest Washington, there, there seems to be a strong opinion in general against tolling. Perhaps the understanding that on specific project basis there may be need so long as it's specific and time limited, et cetera. But as proposed right now, the entire process by the state of Oregon will have a significant impact on residents of Southwest Washington, as well as the 70,000 plus people who live here and work there. So what I would propose is that uh, that you have, when you take the opportunity to review the background information and then look at the uh, attending resolution, I would ask that the council consider uh, signing the resolution so that we can share that with the uh, regional tolling committee as well. Lindsay, anything you'd like to add? No, there's nothing I'd like to add. It's um, you know the the resolution you have before you, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it, though. You know, when you think about the impact of multiple tolls on our commuters to across the bridge to Oregon, and then the fact that they also pay taxes in Oregon on wages earned, it's it's really an incredible. Um, Taking taking of uh, their their earnings because they do have to go across the the bridges. Um, if they didn't have to go across the bridges and could get high wage jobs right here, they would at least so they tell us. But for a while until we get those jobs developed, we're going to have a lot of people who would be affected very much by this resolution. Um, other thoughts? Madam Chair? Yes, Councillor? Yeah, I, I have a question in terms of timing. So this is like our first look at this today and, and I've read, I, I skimmed through it honestly, I didn't read it in super detail, so um, that's on me. But I guess my question would be, when would the expectation be that we might agree to take this up for adoption at, at some point in the future. Um, and then I guess maybe uh, Councilor Islander, because I didn't read it in detail. Um, so I uh, support it and agree with your with your uh, position and, and this whole discussion on tolling. My, my separate piece would be as it relates to the I-5 bridge replacement in and of itself as a project um, per se. So tolling to pay for this project for some period of time, um, I think is reasonable in terms of how we pay for these large projects. Is that delineated in here somewhere? And, and if you want me to go back and read through it later, I will, um, but just thought I would ask you directly there. So if you look at the, uh, the tail end of the resolution, I'm uh, sorry, I'm gonna pull up the wording here. Um, the conclusion being that the, for the reasons noted above the Clark County Council, as opposed to tolling the I-5 bridge, I-5 corridor, and I-205 corridor as, as proposed, if specific tolls that sunset for specific improvements can be proposed and receive the support of the majority of the publics affected, then they should be considered. So I, I believe that opens the possibility of doing an I-5 bridge with a toll so long as there are specifics and that the public is supportive. Does that answer? Yeah, I think so. Um, because I just don't think, you know, just realistically with regard to how capital budgets are happening right now that the bridge will get built without some sort of tolling function. Um, and, and I don't know that it's going to go out to public vote or how we measure the support of the majority of voters. Um, so that would be my only concern about that particular line. Um, and again, we can, you know, massage it a bit if you're open to that, but that would be my concern. I think there's, um, significant support, most recent polling done in Clark County for the new bridge. And I think that's, um, so, so that's out there. Uh, the question is, it's not, not likely going to get built without some sort of tolling. Um, and I don't want to be on the record to say that we oppose any and all tolling specifically as it relates to the I-5 bridge. So I just, and there's not going to be a vote. So I just, I'm just wondering about that piece right there. Otherwise, 
Um, I appreciate the work that you've done and, and uh, the research that you've done on, on the rest of it. Uh, so the, Olson, as you look at this particular uh, set of lines 42 through 45, if you see ways that um, it would be better stated, would you please uh, communicate that to um, perhaps uh, Councilor Rylander uh, and Lindsay? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to spend a few minutes and take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, what, one of the things we, we are, I, I think, uh, saying that we don't want to see is a an I-5 bridge toll that goes on in perpetuity because expenses do go on in perpetuity, but so does other uh, types of income. And uh, the problem is that to that base are added other tolls as time goes along. So that's what um, needs to be dealt with somehow in this uh, part of the resolution. Yeah. Councilor Olson, uh, remember as well, as they're proposing right now, beyond the I-5 toll, I-5 bridge toll, there potentially would be another toll for using I-5 through Portland, a toll on I-205. Right. 205, specifically, the original intent, as I understand it, was to take about a seven-mile quarter down around Oregon City and expand that for an additional lane. And they need, they want money for that, but it's it's ODOT has now expanded their reach from fix that particular section down there to an all encompassing program, 24 hours a day plus mobility pricing for additional costs on certain segments at additional times, just to try to change consumer behavior. So this is this is complex. Uh, it clearly, in the case of I-5, would require federal approval in order to do that, and there's a significant question as to what would be allowable or not. So I, I was trying to gather in this enough information to make a case that, that uh, while it's understandable you'd want to do certain things for certain situations for a certain period of time could make sense, it's just lumping everything else on and leaving it wide open of unending just for Clark County residents, I, I just can't see that it makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we're, you know, there's a delineation between the specific I-5 bridge project and then, so I'm, I'm we're on the same page there for sure. Are there comments from council? Um, I, I have a few. As, I'm sorry. Yes, I have a few. You ask for other comments and then. Okay, yes, go ahead. <laughs> you have to pause, take a breath. <laughs> so um, I fully support uh, and appreciate the work that was done on this between Councilor Rylander and, and your serving on that committee as, and Lindsay. Um, there's so many unfortunate things happening all at once. Uh, with our partners across the river, um, just the fact that they're bringing up this congestion value <laughs> tolling, whatever you want to call it, at a time when they're talking about tolling the bridge, uh, the I-5 replacement, is just a bridge too far for the public. You know, we, and then this locally preferred option that added light rail back in at enormous cost, so really a huge separate capital project that they're now lumping together. You know, all of this you put into context in our nation's history, you know, when we first had a federal road system and legislation go into place, they pretty much prohibited uh, tolling on those federal roads. Most roads and bridges throughout the world and other countries would never consider tolls. There are some examples, but the vast majority of bridges are not tolled. Uh, roads are not tolled because they're collected, taxes are collected in so many other ways. We are headed down this wrong road. Uh, and it is absolutely a misnomer to say that value pricing or congestion pricing, all you're doing is penalizing people who, who can't commute during a different hour or just charging uh, people who have discretionary income and don't care 
and across, just driving across the country in places like St. Louis, and you read all the signs, you know, pay another 25 cents per mile and you'll save 10 seconds. I mean, it, you, it's mind boggling what's being proposed by these traffic engineers. And additionally, the cost, the sheer overhead, the administrative cost of collecting those tolls should tell every taxpayer, this is not the way to proceed to spend almost all of our tolling money on the tolling company that's that's collecting the toll. I mean, there's so many bad things going on all at once uh, it, that we, we need to speak out on behalf of our constituents. So uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, uh, Julie, that you'll come up with some words so you feel comfortable signing it. I would like every counselor to have their, their name on this resolution, so I'm hoping we can have all the right words there. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to represent our constituency uh, with this resolution. Thank you, Dick. Now I'm pausing, Councillor. <laughs> Are there other comments from Council? Um, let's talk about the timing. Kathleen, uh, would you say that uh, uh, there would be an opportunity where this can be on the agenda for public input and then uh, later for vote. I didn't understand the first part of your question. Um, so we can put this on um, next week's council time agenda to give um, councilors more time to review it. And then after that, we can put it on the following council meeting, which I believe is on November 1st. Um, if it's not um, solidified today, we can't get it on next Tuesday's Tuesday meeting on the 18th. It's November 1st, a Tuesday meeting. Yes, it is. So if yeah. council talked about it next week, you also have one additional week if needed before the November 1st Tuesday meeting. So, <clears throat> although it was on this agenda um, for, uh, a public comment, it wasn't evident because we haven't talked about it, but we are talking about it now. So let's be sure that if the public knows that if they wish to comment, we welcome that on uh, next Wednesday. And then for it to be up for vote on November 1st. And at that time, uh, let's see, it would be helpful uh, Councillor Olson and any others who wish to make uh, word changes, if we could have those before next uh, council time meeting, so that the, you know, the 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 fight, quote unquote final version is is what we're all looking at. So if that would be possible, that would be very helpful. Other thoughts. Councillor Rylander, sound okay? All right, here we go. <laughs> that is a, a decided uh, situation then. Uh, we'll move to Councillor Reports now. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, go right ahead. That sounds like Councillor Rylander. So last Wednesday, I had the opportunity to uh, attend the Disability Employment Awareness Month celebration at Clark College on behalf of the council and uh, read the proclamation into the record and got an opportunity to present one of the awards to uh, one of our local uh, hardware companies, Park Rose Hardware. Uh, met a, uh, a fascinating group of people. Uh, talk about diversity. Uh, various handicaps, various challenges. Uh, met a, a young woman working with the uh, the uh, sheriff's department, or uh, sorry, the, the Vancouver Police Department in their record system. Uh, I'm not sure what her disabilities are, but she was fabulous, and she gave a great talk. Uh, so it was it was the entertainment was from members of the community, et cetera. Uh, the first time that they'd actually met in the last three years. And so they were they were pleased to to attend, and I uh, I took the opportunity to make some connections on the sidebar uh, 
I have contacts at Southwest Washington Humane Society, and so I connected to them to, with the group to see if there's a possibility that any of their people might have a fit in some of the positions at Southwest Washington Humane Society. So anyway, it was it was well received. Uh, some nice talks, some some good entertainment, some awards handed out, and I enjoyed representing the council. And thank you for doing that, Madam Chair. Yes, Councillor. Yeah, I just want to, um, you know, just piggyback on Councillor Islander. That event is uh, like one of the highlights of the year for me. I've attended every year. I was out of town last week and wasn't able to do it. So I'm glad, um, Councillor, you were able to step in. It's a phenomenal event. Um, really recognizing uh, those companies and those individuals who participate in um, in getting folks to work and into the community. And and it is really it's an uplifting and fun event. And um, and Councillor Islander, thanks for bringing it up. Other councillor reports? Okay, hearing none, let's move to the work session requests. And uh, let's start with uh, the one that was added this morning to the, the written agenda on body and dash cams. We have the feeling uh, that given that the uh, funds will be coming to the county um, as early as March of 2023, that it is not too early now and soon to be planning for the, the body and dash cams that ultimately we'll have available for uh, the sheriff's office. And um, I think that will be very important to the public. So given that there is quite a bit to investigate and talk about. Um, we know that Vancouver City has a set of body and dash cams that they investigated and uh, the latter one that they investigated, I believe has turned out well for them. We may or may not wish to have uh, a similar kind of contract to what they do, but that's the kind of thing that uh, could well be investigated in a work session. Uh, Kathleen, is there anything that you would like to add to that and particularly given the timing on that, because there is quite a bit of prep work involved. Yes, and the timing of our schedules too. So the council schedule is pretty tight between now and the last meeting, the first week of December. So um, I, if the council wants to meet on this before the end of the year, um, I would like to recommend that we look at another date and time, like a Wednesday afternoon, because we do have a couple budget work sessions coming. We've got Board of Health on there. We've got our transportation work session. I think we have work sessions on every scheduled available day. Um, and then I also just want to add on that as well, that there's a couple of public hearings that um, we're getting requested for, and these we already have three or four hearings scheduled for a Tuesday meeting. So if council would be open, we could look at also doing a couple special meetings to get a couple hearings done before the end of the year. Madam Chair. Yes. I didn't hear if that was Councillor Medvedge or Rylander. Well, you heard me. So usually you don't hear him. So that was a tip off that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> He's smiling. So. I want to move with alacrity here. There, there isn't a whole lot of new work to do. Uh, most states have had dash cams and body cams for decades. Washington State Patrol has had dash cams for at least a decade. You know, Vancouver is way ahead of us. Uh, Camus already has them. Uh, there are so many examples of what works, what doesn't, who are the best vendors. And by the way, the sheriff himself did a presentation to us. I think, I'm not sure if you were on the council yet or not, but there was a lot of work done by the sheriff on, on the vendors that they were looking at, what kind of uh, hardware and software they, and, and the number of employees they needed. I want to move with alacrity here. You know, time is uh, of the essence. Uh, and I think most of the groundwork that you're talking about has been done. 
And if, if I could just add, I did talk to the, um, I haven't talked to the sheriff recently. I mean, we did go over their budget request last week and I don't think that they have done a lot of research on the vendors. Um, but in talking with the city of Vancouver, they did share with me, there was a lot of IT work and prep and checking that took months um, to prepare on the IT side. So I just want to share that, that it's not just the, about the vendor, but how it integrates with our current system and what works for the, the deputies as well, so. Madam Chair? Yes, Councillor? Uh, two items. Uh, I had mentioned previously, I just want to have it on the record as well, that I had mentioned the possibility of including the animal control officers into this mix. There's not many of them, I know that, but there have perhaps been enough situations in the past where uh, some sort of camera capability, either in their vehicle and or on their person, interactions with members of the public, sometimes some of those have gotten heated in having a record of that. So there might be consideration of adding that in because I don't think it's going to be much on the on the cost side of things it would have some benefit. The other I guess would be a question relative to to intent on any sort of public comment or feedback or awareness or input in this process when you just start rolling it out. Again, just trying to make sure that the public is aware whether that's a sort of a, a public meeting, public session where somebody comes in and presents on what's the possibilities are and the public has an awareness that that's coming up and has an opportunity to provide comment and input, positive or negative, that goes with it. They just want to plant that seed. And thank you for bringing up the animal control question again. That is basically a function of numbers of CAMS ordered and and uh, making sure that it would meet the needs of those in animal control if that decision is made to include them. Um, frankly, I would like to suggest a special meeting for this purpose, whether it be on uh, Wednesday afternoon, as you suggested, or um, as soon as, if it were next Wednesday, what would that conflict with as far as um, well, the, the uh, tolling resolution in white paper is at next week's council time. What in the way of work sessions are scheduled for next week, Kathleen? Next week is the 2022 fall budget supplemental work session. Oh, that would be an important item. <laughs> uh, let's see. You had suggested the possibility of a special meeting. Were you thinking of a particular date? Well, it looks like there's already a hold on November 2nd for the 179th um, work session that will be open to the public. And I believe that one we're accepting public comment per the council's request. Uh, I would have to look also at the, if you were wanting to include, obviously, the sheriff's office personnel, our finance team, and Mark Gassaway. So I, I'm not, I have not looked at the sheriff's calendar, but I would have to coordinate um, with them as well if you're wanting them to be included in this conversation. But, Definitely so, yes. Yeah. So yeah I, on, I'm just going to I kind of follow along with Kathleen. Maybe she can come back to us next week with some possibilities of dates, maybe in November or December. I can do that. Yes, I will look at. So who all is there anybody else other than the sheriff's office um, and possibly the finance team? Would you like included in the work session from a staff perspective? <coughs> I would assume IT will include IT, IT. as well. And then as far as non-staff that would have something to say would be other users from outside the county who have uh, come to their own conclusions about certain systems. And I believe um, that might go beyond uh, Vancouver City. There might be other cities that have adopted a system that would be uh, good to know about. I don't, I don't know what they are, but I, I believe there are some.
Okay, I will brainstorm on different um, stakeholders that you may want to include and some dates and I can bring back that to the council next week for your consideration. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned December and we have no council meetings in December. As far as a special meeting, speaking for myself, particularly at the, the first of the month, I would be very willing to have uh, attendance at a special meeting uh, at that time in order to get this um, underway in a meaningful way for uh, purchase soon. Because with those funds coming in March of 2023, we do need some, some decisions pretty soon. Yes, and depending on how, and I'll, I'll try to put down all these questions too for next week because, you know, one of the things is we, there may be contracts out there that we can go ahead and move forward and purchase. And if we're not going to do that, then we're going to have to do an RFP, which will extend that timeline on when we can purchase. But I'll put together some options for you. Very good. So, Since this one I, is I just under, want to... uh, time certain of, of date coming forward, I do appreciate trying to expedite this uh, by council so we can make some decisions. Thank you. I, I did want to just add, based on the last comments, that you know all the the chiefs and sheriffs around the state work together. They work together in this county as well. They've had these discussions uh, primarily when you're putting um, either dash cams or body cams on a patrol. Patrolmen, it, you know, that is their business. How they create their SOPs, when to, how they're turned on, how they're turned off. Um, you know, these are all police uh, related, law enforcement related protocols. You know, so I don't want to get into their business at all. And we are not inventing the wheel here. I mean, pretty much we should have the sheriff come in and say, here's the vendor. Here's what we propose. Here's what it's going to cost, and then we should approve it or not. You know, I don't. So I don't want to get outside of our lane. Uh, the one question I have, because we, I don't think it's come up in any discussion, whether at law and justice or otherwise, when we were initially working on body camps, what what's going to happen in corrections? You know, I already know there's a lot of dead spots in the jail uh, that aren't covered by CVTV, and they should be. Um, but body camps for um, corrections officers is uh, an issue as well. Uh, but so anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. I appreciate uh, that we, we are going to move forward deliberately and quickly on this issue, knowing that we're going to have the resources, as uh, the chair mentioned, beginning in March. Very good. Um, are we ready to move on to the next work session? Okay. Um, this is on the future of electrification in Clark County. Um, I'd like to give you just a, a, a moment here of background. It was uh, suggested to me that we take this up immediately. And I had the uh, reply on that that I felt like this might be a topic that we need to postpone until January, um, given the incredible um, scheduling that we have between now and the end of uh, uh, December. And I think um, our last discussion on body and dash cams kind of confirmed that. This topic of electrification had come to us from Councillor Rylander initially, and um, I concur completely that it is an important one that we need to have ultimately a white paper and a, a, a resolution on. I'm just feeling like the timing on it uh, may need to carry out a ways uh, because you know that this is one on which the public um, will really wish to weigh in because it is highly uh, interesting and highly controversial both. But with that introduction, I um, I would just like to say, I think the topic is very important to the county. And thank you for bringing it up. And if you would please introduce it by content, um, Councillor Rylander and Lindsay, 
we'd appreciate hearing about your um, interest in the, the issues. Uh, Chair Bowerman, um, last week there was a request to amend the agenda to add this as a work session item, and so it is reflected in the minutes as well that Council already approved doing a work session on this topic, and staff will be reaching out to um, the Clark Public Utilities Commissioner um, and have her join us um, early next year. Yeah, early next year is the point of the discussion today. And if that has been decided uh, definitively, then we're good to go um, because council did agree to have a work session, but I don't know that we had agreed upon the timing because when I received an email, the suggestion was made to me strongly that we have that work session now. So. If it is for indeed, if it is for next January, uh, then that is a that is a good thing that would fit with with our schedule. Madam Madam Chair, yes, Councillor. So I I, I appreciate the uh, the challenge on on timing, uh, which is fine. Uh, uh, we do have a, uh, a draft of a white paper on the topic and some wording to start working down a resolution path as well. Uh, there will be probably by early January be some heightened sense of interest and awareness by the public given that the anticipation is that our gasoline taxes will increase 46 cents per gallon January 1st due to the new carbon tax, which of course all ties into electrification of vehicles, this target for uh, preventing the sale of fossil fuel vehicles starting in 2035 in the state of Washington. So the public will have a sticker shock starting January 1st when their taxes go up dramatically. So perhaps uh, trying to find some time, you know, by within a couple of weeks, sort of mid-January, may be a very timely time for the discussion topic. And there may be some people from the public who has some thoughts and observations. And you have talked with Nancy Barnes at PUD, right? Yes, ma'am. I've talked with Nancy and she has uh, one or two people that she said they would, she would bring with her. They would love to do a, about an hour. We just talked generally about an hour. I've already been in touch with the uh, support person and I've shared that with staff here as well so that they can make arrangements appropriate time uh, and get everything prepped. Okay, um, is this uh, satisfactory with council the way we are talking about it now for next, actually next year? <laughs> okay, Lindsay here, report on policy issues. Are there any? Nothing further from me today, thank you. Okay. We will then move into executive session out of council time. Today, it may very well take about 45 minutes. We have two issues before us per RCW 42.30.110 section 1G, and then a session on collective bargaining for about 20 minutes. I don't anticipate that there will be a um, uh, reporting out or action taken afterwards but right now it is 1140 and uh, I would say that by 1220 we would be back to uh, adjourn the council time does that sound right everybody okay I'll see you in executive session counselors thank you So the council is extending their executive session for another 15 minutes and we will be returning at 1235. Thank you. Are we recording? It is Wednesday, October 12, 2022. This is the conclusion of council time for the day. We have started the day at 9 a.m., <coughs> excuse me, with a, a work session on a capital improvement plan dealing with the parks. 
We then went into council time and we concluded after that with two work sessions, neither of which call for um, uh, uh, coming out of the process with any uh, decisions to be made today. So, as a consequence, thank you, councillors, for being back at council time, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>